We ask that our hearts would be open and that our spirits would be sensitive to hear the word of God. Yes, Lord. We ask that the speaker would be hid behind Christ and that we would hear Christ speak to us this evening. Today, whatever the time or the hour may be when this message would come to the respective souls, that these individuals would be blessed and encouraged as a result of what's been said today. Yes, this is my prayer, and I pray it in Jesus' precious name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is found in the book of Isaiah, and that is Isaiah chapter 41. I want you to follow me to Isaiah 41 verse 10. It's one of my favorite scriptures because I like to think that I am one of God's favorites, okay? And I think that we all need to think that because he loves us individually as if we were the only person whom he would have had to die for. I am one of God's favorites, not that he favors me more than you, or not that he favors you more than me, but that his love for me is as special and unique as if I was just the only person on earth. Amen. And his love for you is the same. Amen. Isaiah 41.10. Go there with me, please. Isaiah 41.10. It says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. My name is Andre Lafayne Battles. Many of you know me. Some of you do not. Who I am is not important. What I am, however, is a child of God. And even that perhaps is not as important as what I will say next. And that is, is that I want to be a disciple. I want to follow Christ. I want to be an obedient child of God. It's one thing to say you love the Lord and that you follow him. It's something completely different to obey him. And that is where we are striving to be like Christ in our area of obedience. Now, I want to say that in this life, we're going to go through trials. We're going to go through temptation. We're going to experience things that are going to try us, that are going to test our faith in the word. And one of the things that I'm going to speak on tonight, or I guess I should say my testimony that I'm going to share, is about a job situation that just took place with me just a few days ago. And I'm going to share this because I want someone to be encouraged and perhaps to make a better decision than the one I made. But I'm going to be completely transparent and open and honest with you this evening because I believe that there is a blessing there for someone to be able to benefit from. I worked at a particular place, and I noticed that almost from the very beginning when I began my employment there, that I was under heavy criticism for just about everything that I did. Now, the nature of my job was in the area of customer service. So this means I had to deal with customers on a regular basis. In fact, the vast majority of my job centered around serving the customer, greeting them, making eye contact, communicating with them. These are the things that will not only impress the customer, but that will encourage them to return when they want more products to be served to them or when they want uh, more things done, if you will. And I felt like I was doing that part of my job well. Yes, Lord. You, you know, I understand also that when we come into this life, we are fighting not only cultivated sin. And when I say cultivated, meaning things that we learn how to do based on our experience. But we are also fighting hereditary weaknesses. Things that are passed down to us from our parents, right? But with that also, we are fighting the powers that be that assail themselves against you and I. You see, when we call ourselves Christian, we are putting ourselves in a, in a bracket, in a category that marks us for death. What do I mean by that? The devil already hates you. We need to make that clear. Satan hates you with a hatred that is deeper than we could fully understand. And with that hatred, Satan is trying at all times to tempt, 
destroy, frustrate, and separate you from God. It is his desire to pass you through such trouble that you would give up your allegiance with God. The devil does not like when God's people read the word. Because in the word, we find our strength, we find our encouragement, and we find the hope and the strength to go on. What the devil is trying to do is to separate God's people from the reading of the word because in that word, there is life. But without the word, there is no life. And what the devil will do, he will employ men and women who are on his payroll. Men and women who will easily take his suggestions. The devil will employ men and women in your life to tempt you, to frustrate you, to help isolate you so that your allegiance and your relationship with the word begins to lack. Where you'll begin to start looking at the circumstances that you're dealing with and by doing so you're taking your eyes off of God. And when you take your eyes off of God and you take your eyes off the word, now you're isolated and in a corner where the devil wants you. And now you're making emotional decisions. There are many children born in emotional situations. There are many marriages that end because of emotional decision making. There are opportunities that perhaps we did not get a chance to fully take out throughout the entire uh, we didn't see the fruition of the gift because we made emotional decisions that thwarted us from the path. And when I stop and I think about the situation that I faced on my job, I must be honest and admit that I allowed for the distraction of the spirit of others to cause me to take my eyes off of God for a moment. You see, I am not afraid to share my story. And one of the reasons why... I'm not afraid, is because I am hidden behind the cross. Christ is my redemption. Christ is the reason as to why I can overcome and why I've overcome. Amen. Revelation 12, 11. We overcome through the word of our testimony, through the blood of the Lamb, and through the power of our testimony. And when I share my story, I know that that puts someone in a position to be encouraged because really we are not all that different. That's right. Amen. The same enemy that tries to assail me is the same enemy that's assailing you. The only difference is that he might be doing things a little different depending upon what your proclivity for sin may be. You may have a problem with one area and I may have with another. So the devil will dangle different things in front of you, but the methods are always the same. His desire is to break your allegiance from God. And with my job situation, I noticed that there was a particular supervisor of mine that always had a problem with everything I did. One day they pulled me to the side and said, you talk to the customers too much. Now, my job was to greet the customer. My job was to make the customer feel happy. But you pull me to the side and you say, you know what, maybe you're talking a little too much to the customer. You need to focus maybe more on making the product. I'm not going to say what I was doing, but I will say that what I was doing, uh, it was a dual of a responsibility. Not only did I have to speak to the customer, but I had to prepare a particular thing for this customer as well. I had to make what they wanted. And my mentality always was that if I make the customer happy, if I greet the customer, if I make eye contact, if I make them feel comfortable, then at least for those five to ten minutes that they're with me, I can help them to forget about the problems that they may be facing on their job. I can help them forget about the problems perhaps that they're facing in the community for that five to ten minutes that they're in my possession. So my job to me is not just to provide a service, but it is to give them an atmosphere where they can feel comfortable enough to confide in me because my first job in any place where I work is to do the work of the Lord. And so I see a soul and I'm not just thinking, well, how can I make this person's food? I'm wondering what is it going on in their lives and what advantage can I use to my advantage to get closer to them so that I can leave a scripture in their hands 
or so that I can be able to slip a prayer in there or that I can be able to do or say something that's going to encourage that soul. And that's what I'm always thinking, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. And I was able to do this successfully. And you see, the devil don't like it when you are working in that manner, living for the Lord, even in your job. The devil don't like it. And the devil, have you ever seen the movie The Matrix? Some of you perhaps have never seen it. Here is the idea of The Matrix. You have three main characters in the film. And their job is to enter into the matrix, a system, and unlock people who are frozen within that system or locked in that system but don't know it. Their job is to open the eyes of those who are blind. And by doing so, they open them up to another re uh, existence that they never knew was possible because they had no idea that they were a slave to the system to begin with. You and I are the individuals as Christians who are called to go into the world, the matrix of the world, and pull souls out of the system. And we are called to do it with wisdom. We are called to do it with love. We are called to do it with stamina, because it's going to take strength, courage, and stamina to do what God has called you to do in the face of tribulation and in the face of ridicule. And I noticed immediately when I first got to this job, there was no issue. Because at first I was quiet. I didn't say anything about the Lord. I didn't proclaim the Lord's name. I was feeling my, safe, my way around just to see what kind of atmosphere I was in. And once I got a little comfortable and I began to say, you know what, I can safely put in a plug for the Lord here. Or I can safely talk about God in this situation. I began to do just that. And customers began to notice it. And customers would come in and smile with me and say, what's the word for today, brother? Customers would come in and say, oh, I'm going through this situation. I want you to pray for me. Customers would come in and pour their hearts out to me because in almost every situation when we are called to serve, we will begin to realize that there are men and women waiting to pour their heart's concerns out, but they just had nowhere to pour them out to. And when we stand in the gap, God can use you as a vessel to bring a blessing to someone else. And I began to experience this. But lo and behold, as I began to do this on the job, the enemy took notice. And like the movie The Matrix, there is an entity in The Matrix called the agent. And let me just tell you about the agents. The agents would always show up on the scene when those heroes of the film were in their attempt of releasing or breaking someone free from the matrix. You never would see the agent until the agent was tipped off about the fact that there was someone in the system trying to bring others out of it. And immediately when the, when the agent noticed that there was something fishy going on, the agent would pop up on the scene trying his best to stop the forward progress of the hero of the movie. The agent, brothers and sisters, is Satan. The agent is Satan and his demons. See, here now, you perhaps have never seen Satan with your own naked eye. But what you have seen is Satan using people. What you have seen is Satan possessing the body of someone who is making themselves available to be used. You see, God wants to use you. And Satan wants to use you. And you've got to ask yourself, who will you willingly give yourself over to? Now, by not making a decision, you've made a decision already. And this is why it's important the way we dress. This is why it's important what we eat. This is why it's important what we watch. This is why it's important what we listen to. Because we are walking billboards. Advertising for either one power or the next. Now, some of us, when we're younger, and especially younger Christians, we will get beside ourselves and say, well, why is it important what I watch? I love the Lord. Why is it important where I go and what I listen to? I love God. I can still listen to Boosie. I can still listen to Drake. And I, I can still listen to that old school Tupac and some Biggie and some other things. And we ask these questions really because our heart is not converted. We are not at the place in our lives where we realize that what we listen to, what we watch, 
has everything to do with who we belong to. And so as younger Christians, we will complain when the minister or when the pastor or when a lay person tells us that we need to be careful about what we watch and listen to because we feel as if they're infringing upon our freedoms. Or that you are telling me too much, man. Just g- g- give me some space. Uh, give me a couple of feet so that I can concentrate on what I want to do. Let me make my own decision. And you know, God will step back and allow you to make your own decisions. And then as time goes by, you will be running to God, confessing and begging him to take you back after you've realized that the decisions you've made weren't the best. Well, that's a whole nother story. I'm not going to go into that. But I want you to know that on this job, I faced some heavy criticism. There was another young man that worked with me, and I understood quite early that he was against me. And I couldn't understand why. I, I, I never understood why. I never got in his way. I never made him do anything. I, although I was his senior on the job, I could have easily told him, well, you need to do this and that you need to do that. But I stayed out of his way. And in fact, I stayed out of his way to such a, a, an extent that I would do things that I could have asked him to do. I would do it just to stay out of his way. And all of a sudden, as the time would go by, I began to hear reports that so-and-so didn't like working with me. And that so-and-so was giving tales, if you will, concerning my behavior at work and that I was doing such and such, which were all lies. In fact, there was an incident on the job where a particular uh, uh, vessel that we put certain items in went missing. And it was not my job to man this item or to uh, have security over this item. I went into this product and in this item like everyone else. And when I was done with it, I would put the lid back on it and put it back in the freezer and I'd go about my business. And one day I noticed that we couldn't find the lid and I didn't ask any questions. I figured that they knew why the lid was not on the top of this particular item. But three or four days after that, I was questioned and the question was, hey, so-and-so said you were the last person with the lid and that you were the last person that we saw with the lid and that since you had it, the lid has been missing. And I scratched my head and I said to myself, why would this person say this about me? And then the Holy Spirit said, duh, Andre, this is spiritual warfare. You see, brothers and sisters, what we don't understand, just because you love the Lord, just because you give a faithful tithes and offering, just because you pray, just because you watch your diet, perhaps, just because you read the Bible, it does not disqualify you from trouble. It does not disqualify you from trouble. Many of God's people think that if we buddy up with God and get close to God, it's going to protect us from all issue. But that's not true. In fact, I want you to consider that when the storms of life arise, we may quickly pray that the storm would cease. But if we are conscious of what God is doing, Hardly does he ever stop the storm. What he will do, however, is strengthen you through the storm. The storm will perhaps not cease when you pray for it to stop. But what God will do is that he will strengthen you. He will strengthen your spiritual muscles through that storm. So you're praying and you're begging God, Lord, please change my situation. I need a new job. Or Lord, change my situation. I need a new husband. I uh, changed my situation. I need a new wife. Lord, these children you gave me, what, is on, what on earth is going on? Even David, uh, not David, even Adam did it. When God questioned Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam shrugged the responsibility on God and said, this woman you gave me. Mercy. Right? And then Eve, she shrugged the responsibility. She didn't take responsibility for her own actions. She said, well, the serpent. Everyone was delegating the blame to someone else. And if we're honest, we do that in our situations today. We're always blaming our circumstances. We're always saying, God, well, Lord, if you change this, I'd be better. Lord, if you gave me this, I would do well. Lord, if you only opened that door or if you fired that boss or if you let this person out of my life or if you let that person in my life, I'd do better. And we try to make deals with God. 
When God is saying, look, here's the deal. You go through what I'm putting you through with my strength. That's right. Let me empower you. Let me encourage you. And you know, I couldn't see that. I couldn't see that God was trying to make me better through the storm. But I was praying that the storm would cease. I would go home and I would pray. I'd say, Lord, you know, I don't like my boss. I don't like what I'm dealing with on the job. And you know, it's funny because sometimes as Christians, we think that God will put us in a circumstance and then leave us there to figure, to see if we can figure a way to get out of it on our own. But that's not how God operates. God is saying to you and I that we've got to call on his name at all times and depend on him and put him on the scene of the case immediately. And how do you do that? You pray. You turn the situation over to God. And you let him know in full detail what's going on. And you ask him to give you the strength to stand until he moves. But too often we look at our situation and we say, Lord, you must not love me. Lord, you must be mad at me. This must be punishment for something. Lord, you must be coming back to haunt me from some bad thing I did in the past. You know, the devil is very successful at getting our minds caught up in jargon. In foolishness. When the Bible says here in Isaiah 41.10 that we are to fear not. Fear not. Why? Because he is with us. Somehow, some way, in the midst of our storm, we forget where God is. And when we forget where God is, we tiptoe around emotional decision making. You know what? I'm going to cuss my boss out today. Or you know what? I'm going to quit. Or you know what? I'm going to break up with my wife. I'm tired of dealing with her foolishness. Or I'm going to break up with my husband. Or I'm going to end this contract with said person. Or whatever the case may be, we begin to flirt with emotional decision making. And one thing I can guarantee you is that any time in your life or mine when we've made emotional decisions... We can look back at that time in our lives and see that there was a trail of disaster left in our wake. Because emotional decision making never lands us in the best of circumstances. It always places us in more trouble. Always. In fact, I want you to go with me to the book of Samuel. It is 2 Samuel, in fact. I want you to go with me to 2 Samuel. And I want to share with you a story there about one of my favorite Bible characters. His name is David. Okay? David is one of my favorite Bible characters. I love David because David was a real life character. And when I say real life, you see every level of someone's progress played out in the life of David. From a little young man that was just a shepherd over his father's flock unto the place where he finally became a king. And in between all of that, there were lessons in different places where David had to stop and learn something. Where David had to be prepared for the next step. But I want you to realize if today you are like me and you've made some emotional decisions that you are not by yourself. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 27. Now I'm going to give, we're going to start at verse, two, or verse 1. I'm going to just, uh, it's 1 Samuel 27. We're going to look at verse 1 or we're just going to go through the, a few verses. That's 1 uh, Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel 27. All right. 1 Samuel 27 is where the story begins to unfold. And in this story, we see David, who is in fear of his life. He's in fear of his life from King Saul. Okay? Now, why is David in fear of his life? Some of us know the story. Perhaps some of us don't. We understand that David was God's anointed King, He was going to take the throne at some point in time in the future. In fact, the kingdom was snatched from the hands of Saul. 
And although Saul was still the reigning king, God's favor no longer rested on Saul. So Saul was a king sitting on a throne, but had no power because he no longer had the support of God. And that is a story all of in itself. Some of us are serving in positions where God has removed his presence from us a long time ago. Yet we're still serving that position, or at least it seems as if on the outside we're serving that position. This was King Saul. And because Saul was familiar with the fact that God had removed his blessing from him, Saul was also familiar with the fact that the next person in line was David. He was familiar with this. Saul was troubled by this. In fact, there came a time when David killed Goliath. We know the story. And the women of Israel would sing a song. And in the song, they would sing and say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. It was the number one hit at the time. And I remember listening or reading the Bible story, and I could imagine the type of spirit that came over Saul when he heard the women of Israel singing this song. Because here he is still the king. And if we read the story and we study the story of Saul, what we understand is that Saul was more jealous over the, uh, the companionship and over also the, uh, the, the, what is the word? He wanted the... Not just the attention, the approval. Samuel wants, Saul wanted the approval of the people more than he wanted the approval of God. And so he was willing to disobey God to secure the approval of men. How many of us are in that situation or have ever been? Where we're willing to, to, to give the, our, 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 our allegiance to a boyfriend or a girlfriend, although we know that God is telling us not to have sex before we get married. How many of us know that we have at times done things for a boss on a job, although we knew it was wrong, that we shouldn't have done it, whether it was we were asked to steal or whether we were asked to uh, define the line of right and wrong, but we did it anyway because we wanted the approval of a man. We wanted the approval of people who we felt could elevate us. We wanted the approval of people who we felt could support us in our position or in our desire to obtain a position. Well, this was the situation that David found himself in, in fear of his life, because Saul wanted him dead. And Saul was not a passive individual in his pursuit of David's life. Saul was trying to kill David for real, for real. He was really trying to kill David. In fact, there's a story where David was playing his instrument for Saul in the kingdom one day because Saul would jump in and out of the spirit. He would jump into a negative spirit in one minute where the demons were on top of him, driving him mad. And then it would call for David or some other uh, 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 instrument or some other uh, musician, not musician, but uh, yeah, musician. musician, right, to come in and play a song or to minister to Saul in such a way that would calm Saul down. And one of these particular situations, David was playing for Saul. And the spirit of the devil seemed to be going away from Saul. And Saul got up and grabbed his javelin and tossed it at David. And missed David by hair's inch. And David had to be hid by Saul's son, Jonathan. This was the kind of life that David lived for some time. Now I want you to understand, as we go back to the main idea of the story, is that David, like me, and perhaps like many of us, have made emotional decisions. Now, I want you to remember that uh, Goliath was a Philistine. Mm -hmm. I need you to remember that. Amen. Because the Philistines were the ones who stood up against the armies of Israel mm -hmm. in defiance against God. That's right. And when uh, Goliath joined arms with the Philistines, it wasn't to throw a party and to celebrate the God of Israel. It was to destroy them. It was only because of David's faith and the power that he had through Christ that David was able to vanquish his enemy, Amen. Goliath, and the Philistines. But I want you to see just how emotional decision-making can make a wise man look stupid. 
how emotional decision making can make a wise person look as dumb as dirt. Because here now, David is so afraid for his life running from Saul that he goes into confederation with the Philistines. If you read with me here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27, it says in verse 1, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. David was afraid for his life. And you know, it's comforting to me to be able to read Bible scripture where men and women who have come before me, men and women who I know will be saved in heaven, where I can see the record of them making dumb decisions just like I do. Why does that comfort me? Because sometimes, just sometimes, the devil would have us thinking that there ain't no way we'd ever be like David. Ain't no way we'd ever be like Abraham. Ain't no way we'd ever be like Elijah and Enoch and Jacob and all of these Bible characters. You're wasting your time. They were holy men. They were righteous men. Look at you. Look at what you did. Look at what you were watching. Look at what you did in, over there in the corner when you thought nobody was watching. And the devil will play these games with your mind and have you thinking that there's no way on God's green earth that he could possibly save you. Help us, Lord. He'll have you looking at yourself. Praise God that we don't have to look at self. We must focus on Jesus. Because he told us again in Isaiah 41.10 that he will be with you. And it doesn't matter what you've done. The devil will come and make you think that God is separating his love from you. The devil will use people, just like I talked about the movie The Matrix. The devil always uses people to thwart your perceptions, to stop your forward progress, to make you think that you are the most revilest, evilest, sinful thing walking the earth. The devil wants you to think that. Because if you begin to believe that, it will discourage your faith in God. And when your faith in God is discouraged, you start doing things like what David did. And what did David do? He said, in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And look at how he is trying to figure this out in his mind. It says, and Saul shall despair of me, meaning Saul will get tired of hunting me because he'll know that I'm hidden within the enemy's camp. And it says, and he will no longer seek to destroy me, so I shall escape out of his hand. And it says in verse 2 of 1 Samuel 27, and David arose and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath, and David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his, tw uh, with his two wives. And it goes on to say that David lived in Philistine for one year and several months. Now, this doesn't make any kind of sense to a Bible scholar. And I say that because anybody knows that Weren't the Philistines the army on the enemies of the Israelites? Weren't these the same people who sometime before got in league with Goliath, a man that was over 10 feet tall that had 11 digits? The Bible talks about Goliath's brother had 11 digits on his feet and 11 digits in his hands. That's how big they were. They were giants. And so this is the same Philistine army who for 40 days would march into a particular place and they would approach the children of Israel and mock them. And not only mock them, but mock their God. And this is the same David who at that time before was filled with such righteous indignation that he could no longer stand to hear this uncircumcised Philistine talk about his God. But this is the same David who now in position of fear where calamity is knocking on his front door, decides to make a foolish decision. And where now he was trusting in God, he trusts in his own way. He devised for himself a way to keep him safe from Saul. He, didn't, he forgot that God was going to watch over him. And Andre forgot, 
on his job that God was going to watch over me. You see, God puts you in places to encourage your spiritual muscles. I need somebody to hear me. God puts you in places to strengthen your faith. He puts you in rocks of hard places or puts you between a rock and a hard place to make you a better Christian. But what we often do is we'll either pray our way out of the hard place or we will run ourselves out of the hard place. And so on the job this past Monday, I had been in my thoughts and in my feelings and I had been accused of something that very day on the job. And I brushed it to the side. You know where I made my mistake? I thought that I was supposed to carry the burden on my own shoulder. And by that, what I mean is, I would talk to God. I said, well, Lord, help me to get through this. And then I would try my best to appease my bosses. I would try my best. See, the key word is my best. I would try in my own strength to appease the situation. Or I would try to make light of the situation and try and be buddies with the person who was my enemy. One of the supervisors who I knew didn't get along with me. But all it was doing was putting a disdain in them for me even more. Where I should have stood my ground and just been the Christ-like person that I was called to be, even in the midst of the storm, and just smile in the midst of the storm, I decided to go another route. And I began to see how no matter what position I took on, that there was still more issues being brought up against me. More, 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 more uh, accusation being brought up against me every day. And I would go home and I would tell my wife about what I was going through. And I would feel demoralized. Because customers would come and they would be so happy when they saw me. In fact, someone would come in. One gentleman came into the job and in front of my boss said, he should be the boss. And said that in my face in front of my manager. And why do I say that? I say that because it goes to show the kind of spirit and attitude that I possessed on the job. I was a bubbly spirit. I was a happy spirit. And I did not want to take the shine away from my boss. In fact, I would always find opportunity to bring attention to the fact that he was the boss and that I was only the helper. Whenever I noticed people looking at me too much, Whenever I noticed them praising me too much, I would quickly say, well, you know, that's the boss, Mr. So-and-so right there. Uh, and that's his wife, his assistant. I would deflect the attention from me because a wise person told me that you never outshine the boss. But when the devil is on the scene, Satan didn't like, he didn't care about me being kind to the customer. He didn't care about me asking the customer what kind of item they desired and how big or small of a product that they wanted. Those things didn't matter to Satan. What Satan didn't like was that he knew my mind and that my mind was hunting for an opportunity to pray with somebody. And that often I would pull someone to the side and share with them my Facebook page where I would do my ministry work. Or I would share a link to a video. Or I would share a prayer with someone. I would hold their hand and pray with them. I would encourage them. There was a young lady who would come in there. She lived on the streets. And we had a tip jar. And when the bosses were scrambling at the tip jar so that they can put that extra 4 or $5 in their pockets and go home, the young lady that was poverty that lived on the streets and she looked and smelt like a woman that lived on the street, I would go in that tip jar and whatever tips that were supposed to be mine, I would give to her. Because she was less fortunate than me. And all of these things rubbed my bosses the wrong way. Because in their mind, they're thinking, well, I should be doing that. I'm the boss. Why is he my subordinate? Why is he giving this girl this money? And the girl would come in there almost every day and order food. Money that she was able to secure from bumming and begging. And not once did they ever offer her anything for free. Not once did they ever say, here, it's on us. It's on the house. I, when God's people are in a place, you are supposed to see beyond the need. You're supposed to see the person behind the person. And that's what the devil don't like. Let me tell you that if you live like Christ called you to live, you will suffer persecution. If you live the way Jesus wants you to live, don't think that it's going to be a catwalk. 
Don't think that it's going to be easy. And let me tell you right now, if you ain't made out of nothing, don't sign up for God's army. If you don't have the strength and the stamina and the perseverance, you better pray for it. You better pray for it because it's coming. The minute you tell God that you want to walk with him, the minute you tell God that you want to serve him, like David, you will find yourself on the wrong side of peace. Like David, you will find that you have more enemies than a little bit. Like David, you'll realize that although you stood for something, although you loved the Lord, although you stood for right. Now, I want you to consider just how unreasonable Saul was. Here now, Saul was the king. He should have been man enough to stand up before Goliath, but he didn't. And no other person in Israel was man enough to stand up. But you have this 15-year-old boy. He was about 15 to 16 years old when, when, Goliath, when David fought Goliath. You have this young boy that's got a faith enough to step up to a grown 10-foot man. And not only step up to him, but vanquish him. That should have put Saul to shame. And matter of fact, if I was Saul, I would have resigned right then. And I would have begged David to take the throne. Because at that point, David showed that he was more valuable. However, we know that's not the story. But the reality is, it made no sense for Saul to act this way. As it made no sense for my supervisors to treat me in the manner in which they were treating me when my spirit was bringing more customers to their store. Jealousy is an evil spirit. And let me not speak as if I am perfect and I've never been jealous. Let me tell you, I've been doing Facebook ministry, YouTube ministry for about 15 years now. And in that time frame, I remember my spirit would become sorely jealous over other men and women who I felt God was elevating before me. And I remember nights on my knees where I had to pray and beg God to take that spirit from me because I knew that I could not see God in peace while looking at brother or sister so-and-so feeling as if God loved them more than he loved me. How could I say I love the Lord and I've never seen him, but when I see his servants, I hate his servant? How on earth? I, 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 I'm jealous of what God is doing in the ministry of someone else because he perhaps has not gotten close enough to me to where he could do it with me. Whose fault is it? Is it God's fault or is it mine? My fault. My fault. Whose fault was it? Saul's or David's? It was Saul's fault. David just stepped up to the plate because he had faith. David wasn't trying to outshine Saul. Andre wasn't trying to outshine his bosses. Andre wanted to simply do what he was called to do and get paid for and go home. I didn't have any visions of grandeur that I was going to take over this particular place. I didn't, take, I didn't have these visions of grandeur that I was going to become a great and mighty person in this particular location. I simply wanted to do my job to the best of my ability, collect my check on a weekly basis, and go home and greet my wife. But I'm going to tell you again that when we walk on this earth, David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I want you to stop and consider that scripture again. I used to think that the valley of the shadow of death was a location. Because he says, yea, though I walk through. So that immediately makes you feel as if that's a location. For example, you might be in a seedy side of town where you know they sell drugs and where Things like cocaine and marijuana and ice and pills get popped around and tossed around. So you are more cautious when driving through that area. And in fact, you're trying to get out of that area as quickly as you can because anything could pop off in that area at any time. But this is not really what the Bible is talking about when it says that you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to understand that locations do nothing to you. The tree ain't going to jump out of its place and uproot itself and come and chase you. The mountain is not going to fall on you. By, I, mean, I mean, it could happen, but that's most likely not going to happen. The sun is not going to fall out of the sky. The moon is not going to lose its light and, and, and put you on a dark path at night. The valley of the shadow of death is your dealings with people. 
And I want you to think about that. The valley of the shadow of death is your dealings with people. Because if you were by yourself in a place, who would you fear? No one. You would not be in competition with anyone. You would not have to try and outshine anyone. You would not have to feel as if you've got to bring yourself down so that the next person don't feel as if you're shining too much because it would only be you. But if you are in a place where there's any other body, any other person with you, you've got to watch out for the spirit of jealousy. You've got to watch out for the spirit of pride and not just in them, in you. You've got to watch out for the spirit of selfishness. You've got to watch out for the spirit that will come over you to make you think that you're better than someone else. Your problems in this life don't begin until they cut that umbilical cord out your mama. That's when your problems start. If we could choose, we would stay in that womb forever. Because your problems don't start until you come into this life and have to deal with other people. But what God is trying to teach his anointed ones. What God is trying to teach his people, even David, what he was trying to teach David is that, yea, though you walk. And see, that's how David could write that psalm, because David been through some things. That's how I can say what I say and don't fear anyone's judgment, because I've been through some things. My testimony is unrefutable. You cannot uh, refute what I say, because it's the truth. It's my story. It's what I've been through. And you cannot refute that. See, the devil don't like your testimony because it's unrefutable. I can argue with you about the scripture. Because you may see the scripture one way, I may see it another. But you cannot argue with me about my story. Because ain't nobody else experienced it but me. So when the devil sees that you are on fire for the Lord and want to share your story in every place that you go, in every situation that you're in, that's when you become enemy number one. Because now he wants to shut your mouth. The only Christian the devil likes is the Christian that don't testify. And there's many of us like that. We think it's enough because we give tithes and offering or we go to church every weekend. The devil's not mad about any of that. The devil don't like it when you testify and when you live out your experience in real time. The devil don't like it when you live out your religious experience in real time, when you practice what you preach. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect. Let me tell you that right now. Uh, let Let me make that clear. I made mistakes on my job. I made some dumb decisions on my job. In fact, I've had more jobs than any five people in my life. I've had more jobs than any five people in my life. And that's the truth. From driving trucks to, to, to hauling trash to flipping burgers to frying chicken to making tacos, working in a hospital, sweeping floors and stripping the, the, the floors and rewaxing them. I've done almost everything you can imagine from a school bus driver even on. I've done it all. I'm not perfect. But what I will say to you as I bring this message to a close is that I want you to know and understand you can go through the valley of the shadow of death, a.k.a. people, and come out unscathed. You can do it. But I'm going to tell you right now, you will never accomplish it. You will never accomplish it effectively if you don't have a relationship with this right here. I'm going to close with this story. Three years ago, I met my wife. I was going through a situation, and I was at the end of my former marriage. Oh, that had already ended. We had divorced. And I was by myself. Now, I'm a man, all right? And I'm going to say right now, I like to be with a woman, all right? But I knew that I had to do it right. Amen. Amen. I love the opposite sex now. Now, I've had to submit that pleasure over to God in times when I was not married because sometimes we can allow for, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, We can allow for our nature to take over and we are no longer temperate, okay? And we could be intemperate in things that that are lawful. We can do too much of a good thing, right? 
But anyway, I said, Lord, I, I want to be in a relationship. I, I want to be loved. And I remember during that time, God told me, if you want love, seek me first. Seek ye first the kingdom. I remember God saying that to me very, very clearly in my mind. And at the time, I had a few girlfriends. But I decided that I was going to put them to the side. I was going to let those relationships go. I had it good. I'm not even going to go into detail how good it was. But I had it good. And I remember saying, Lord, I want you. I want to try you now. I've tried everything else. I've tried my flesh. I know where that's going. I know where that leads to. I, look, there ain't nothing in this life free. Let me just tell you that. Ain't nothing in this life. I don't care how cute you are, how much money you have. Nothing in this life is free. You paying for something. Somehow, some way, let the wise understand. All right? And I remember I cut off the relationships. And I said, Lord, I need to get close to you because I feel that in my spirit. And this very same Bible right here, one evening I was downtown Shreveport, Louisiana, where I was living at the time, and I was reading my Bible, just me and God. I didn't have a woman with me. I wasn't looking for no woman. I had enough women. And I remember I said, Lord, I just need to talk to you. I need to bring back my center of focus on you. And I put my Bible on the dashboard of my truck. I rolled down the window after I had read it for about an hour or two, and I drove off. Didn't realize that the Bible slid off of the dash onto the street. And about three days later, I still didn't notice that that Bible was lost because I had few other Bibles in the house where I was staying that I would read. So one day I got a phone call from my dad in Tyler, Texas, which is about three hours drive away from Shreveport, saying that someone found your Bible. I said, what? Found my Bible? I said, my Bible's on me at all times. What do you mean? Someone found my Bible. Well, what happened is that this Bible was given to me by my dad. And his name is Lafane. And his name is in front of the Bible because it was a gift to him from my mother. And one day, someone was driving downtown Shreveport where I was with my Bible. They noticed that the Bible was on the street and that people were just driving over it. He stopped in the middle of the road and he looked at the Bible and he saw the name in front of it. And he said, that's a really unique name. Why don't I go on Facebook and type that name and see if I can find the person? And sure enough, he did. He found my dad. He messaged my dad and said, sir, I found your Bible. My dad said, my Bible? Where are you, sir? He said, I'm in Shreveport. He said, oh, that's my son's Bible. I gave him the Bible. He must not even know he's missing it. And sure enough, I didn't. I didn't realize that the Bible had slid off the dash. And when I was at work that particular week, I got a call from my dad saying that someone had found my Bible. And the gentleman sent me a picture of the Bible laying in the street, and it was just laying on the ground open like this, and the pages were flapping in the air. You know what God taught me as a result of that story, as a result of that incident? He taught me how valuable this Bible is to my, to my spiritual health. And the reason or the way he did it was to show me that without this word, I'm naked. That I have nothing to rely upon without this word. And I didn't know I was naked. I didn't know that I was spiritually naked without it because I didn't know I didn't have it. But when that man came to my job that day and dropped that Bible off to me, the Holy Spirit hit me upside my conscience and said, Never separate yourself from this word again. Because the day that you do, you are in peril and you are naked and alone and lost just like Adam and Eve were when Help they sinned. Why, what am I saying? What, 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 what am I getting at? Brothers and sisters, in this life, you're going to have some trouble. I will guarantee that. Before you, I can guarantee you two things. I can guarantee you that, number one, you're going to face trouble. And number two, that if Jesus don't come, you're going to die. I can guarantee those two things to you because without fail, that is what has happened in the last 6,000 plus years of Earth's history. You're going to go through something and then you're going to die. That's a guarantee. Yes, Lord. But at the end of the day, what I can also guarantee you is that, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if you have a working, living relationship with this word, you're going to be all right. You going to be okay. I didn't say you wasn't going to go through nothing. I didn't say that. Don't misquote me. 
Oh, that preacher said that if I knew the word, I wasn't going to go through nothing. Whoever preacher told you that, they lied to you. In fact, it's because you know the word, the devil is going to be uh, agitated against you even more. But the truth of the matter is that if you have the word of God with you and not just with you. I know some people carry the Bible and they claim the blood, the blood, the blood. The devil know the blood. The devil been around the blood. Do you have a relationship with God? Do you have the kind of relationship where you know what scripture to turn to when the devil comes at your mind with a particular temptation and you're beginning to start contemplating it, but all of a sudden the spirit hits your mind and it, it turns you to a scripture and you can begin to quote it. Or if you don't remember it, you can go into the Bible and start reading it because that's your strength. In this life, you're going to go through things. People are going to talk about you. People are going to mistreat you. People are going to ridicule you. People are going to separate themselves from you. People are going to point fingers at you. People are going to misuse you, mistreat you, do everything in the book. They'll call you everything but a child of God. I can promise you that. But what I can promise you also is that if you have a working relationship with the word of God, you can get through all of it. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you. We need you like yes. never before. We need you, Jesus. Jesus, you will put us through some circumstances just so that we can admit our weakness. You will allow like Paul, like, not like Paul, like Peter, who said, Lord, I will never betray you. And Jesus said, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Peter didn't believe it. Jesus, help us. But as sure as Jesus said it, it happened. And Father God, many of us think that we're secure with Christ. Many of us think that we're okay. I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. I can do what I want to do. Lord, I've been around the church. I've been around spiritual things all my life. I'm okay. And the devil is looking at us smiling and laughing and saying, look at those silly Christians. But Father God, if we are going to survive the onslaught of the devil's attacks, we've got to be rooted and grounded in the word. If we're not going to make emotional decisions like I did, like David did, we've got to be rooted and grounded in the word. And no, that doesn't mean that we're never going to make mistake. But what it means is that we will quickly rebound if we have a relationship with God. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For we pray this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen.